Thank you for tuning in to WRULP Savannah, Georgia, 107.5 FM, WRU.org. We are Savannah Soundings Community Radio with Global Soul. Welcome to Real Estate Real Talk with myself, Julia M. Spencer, and Daniil Ivanov. Happy Wednesday. Happy Wednesday, everybody. Manic Wednesday, a little. <laughs> yeah, it's a little bit manic today, so we apologize. <laughs> We're still pushing buttons. <laughs> still pushing buttons. There's a fly in here, too, in the studio. Ah. Let's, let's stay professional. Okay, okay, our show right here, Real Estate Real Talk, which you have just tuned into, is on anything and everything related to real estate investing. And we are small real estate investors here in this beautiful city of Savannah. Yes, and indeed. short-term uh, rental hosts. Actually, we are now seasonal rental hosts because the laws have changed. But yeah, we, we change too. Right. <laughs> we change along with, what is what was that book back like 20 years ago or something? Who Moved My Cheese or something? We we moved <laughs> along with the cheese. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> don't remember that one, but no, I don't look it up. It was I like, don't look it up. Yeah. It's like the mice that move where the cheese goes, they are the ones that survive, um, you know? Definitely. You haven't watched, you haven't, that's a business like classic. You got to like, Oh, okay. Gotta I got to watch it. it. Yeah, we and definitely are uh, adaptable. Right, right. But we do still have short-term vacation rentals in other cities where there is no laws yet. Here in Chatham County, of course, things have changed in the last couple of years. So we do have seasonal rentals here now. And it's been quite an interesting ride in the last 13 years that I've lived here now. And uh, we talk about anything and everything related to tax sale foreclosures, regular foreclosures, mortgages, code compliance people, uh, contractors, and house maintenance, tenants, anything and everything. And it's it's interesting uh, sometimes. General contractors. Yeah, we have a lot of failures that we report on, also successes. So you don't have to make the same mistakes that we yeah. did. You know, everything that we share on this show is hard earned, basically. It's not just we read it somewhere in some book. So this happened to so-and-so. It actually happened to us. And we, 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 got the sc- we, we have the scars to show. Right, exactly, exactly. And what we do in between our segments, we actually play music. And at the bottom of the hour, also a couple of announcements. So we're on every Wednesday at noon all the way until 1 o'clock. So please stay on. Don't go anywhere. We're going to play some music to get our notes together and our topics. And we'll be right back after this. So stay on. Don't go anywhere. And thank you for staying on with us here with Real Estate Real Talk with Julia M. Spencer and Daniil Ivanov. Thank you for uh, listening with us to that song. I just picked something. I didn't even know what that was. Actually, I can tell you all. It's Butterflies by Emilian Lewis, I believe. So. All right. There it is. (laughs) (laughs) There it is. On today's show, we don't really have a topic prepared and... I'm a little bit tired of talking because I just like talked for an hour. So I'm a little bit tired, but I am still here. So let's talk a little bit about, I know we came up with one topic, which was regarding allowing pets at your Airbnbs, which is a topic that, you know, I've, I've made shows about before because I typically have in the past not allowed any pets. But when you switch from a short-term rental to seasonal or long-term, you kind of need to consider that because if you don't, and most people do have pets, if you don't, then you exclude yourself from potentially a very good source of income and tenants. So how do you approach that in order not to you know, sacrifice the quality of your property and potentially having to do a lot of remodeling and... Uh, have a lot of headaches and problems with those kinds of tenants. So how do you do that? Just to, not to jump the gun here, but you can't control it. I mean, that's really it. There's some steps that you can do, but you can't really control whether or not somebody's well, going to trash happen. your property yeah. or there's going to be a problem. But there's some some things that you can do to uh, at least encourage your guests or your tenants and to... And maybe protect yourself when stuff happens. Right. And at the end, so you will have some financial, I guess, backup. Right, to, right. To, you know, exactly. exclude those damages at the mm-hmm. end. So, uh, 
But then you uh, you want to start maybe uh, just just as a reminder, we do have a show on that that the law changed about the pets as well at uh, one of the platforms like Airbnb. You remember about the service animals? Yeah, we had that. a show on this about it had to do with service animals versus emotionally um, emotionally support animals, yeah. which there was a difference. We we can talk about that certainly because there's a law now well there's always been a law that service animals have to be allowed wherever people that need those animals are going because they're basically an extension of the person as per the law and they have to be i believe ada certified service animals which is the american um association of disability Disability uh, association something like that right and there's very specific writing on what you're allowed to ask somebody who brings a service animal and what you're not allowed to ask. So a lot of people, you know, kind of, there's a a lot of tenants actually that kind of take advantage of this and kind of try to sneak in their uh, emotional support animal in that category, which is not a service animal. There is a difference. A lot of people don't even know this, but, uh, and there's only certain questions that you can ask even even on platforms like Airbnb, but also on other platforms, but even in in restaurants or other establishments, I believe there's laws. Yeah, there's a lot. Like the, it's kind of the same thing. How when, when you're hiring a person, there is specific questions you're allowed to ask and you're right. not allowed to ask. Right. And but there is the ways to ask it. So, but if you if you are pretty much if you're a landlord or you are host like we are. Just kind of educate yourself. Look at our right. previous radio uh, radio show, or or look up the actual yes. law on yeah. on the um, ADA website. Actually, because we we are all working hard, and the last thing you want to do is get in some legal pro- trouble. Because it's legal you, trouble, but also you know you know having to potentially be liable for a lot of damages that somebody yeah. brought onto you by bringing an animal that's not a service animal and that claims that they are. Uh, in addition to a lot of people have allergies. So this is always like my dilemma that was always in the past is yeah. when somebody says, well, I need this animal because it's a service animal. And I'm like, well, that's cool. But what about the people that come after you that might be allergic? You know, that's a disability as well. So which disability do you yeah, give you advantage prioritize, to? Yeah. Prioritize. <laughs> you got to have to kind of work around that so but in this particular case i think what we finally did decide on one of the properties that we own in atlanta is to allow pets and that kind of like eliminates the whole problem of what questions can we ask what can we not ask we just point out flat allow pets but we do have obviously guidelines We do ask what kind of pet it is, what size is it, you know, and this is something that a lot of landlords do. It's actually a good way to get around having to ask these uh, questions like, okay, what kind of service does this animal perform? Is it really a service animal? Is it emotional support animal? Not the same thing, you know. So how do you get around that? You just allow pets, but then you give specific guidelines for what pets you allow. Now, service animal is not a pet, obviously. I do do get that. So if you have a pet that exceeds our weight requirements, that's actually a service animal. I mean, I'm not going to be a stickler about that. Maybe some some landlords are, but I'm not. I'm not going to worry about that. But what uh, we did. But the, the, I will not allow donkey to come in. The right, house. right. I mean, we read the story horse, about the you know? air, air lion, right? Somebody brought the donkey. I into don't the know. Plant. Somebody <laughs> wanted to bring a donkey as a support animal, emotional support. No, <laughs> no. But I mean, everything that you do in this kind of business has to have a little bit of common sense which is not so common anymore these <laughs> no, days so no, but no. people are losing their common sense left and right yeah and um, i hope there will be no animal right activists i have nothing against donkeys just to just say <laughs> this. i don't want to get in trouble for that i tell you what i almost bought a donkey the other day <laughs> we had no vehicles to get around in but <laughs> in any case, we uh, we did allow pets, and we have our first guest right now in I want to say like ten years that now has brought an animal. And officially, without sneaking in, we did have some snake ins happen before. Right, we had we had a couple of people stay with animals that didn't announce it and kind of just snuck them in, right? Yeah. And of course, we always find out because. I you mean, know, we did have we did have allowed the birds one time, but they were caged. Oh yeah, which, is, which was, was a cool. Parrot. A yes, parrot. Yeah, that was weird because yeah. I, nobody's ever asked that but uh. whenever people ask you though that are pet owners versus people that 
maybe a not pet owners. I, I feel that anyways, this is my opinion. You can chime uh-huh. in on that. Whenever pet owners ask me, can they come with their animal? And I've had people lots of times ask me, even though we had it on all of our listings that we don't allow pets. But in this case, it's one, only one listing where they're allowed. And people are always very, they're, they're bending over backwards, really, to kind of be very friendly and be very nice because they understand that people with pets are not as desired tenants as people without pets. So yeah. a lot of times pet owners honestly are actually friendlier. This is my own experience. And they uh, they also don't haggle over the price all that much, you know. And, and by the way, you can always haggle about any price, even though this is not such a thing that's commonly done here in the United States. But even if you have an Airbnb rental or even if you're renting a place from a rental agency or from another person, the price is always negotiable. So, But people with pets tend to not negotiate as much because they kind of accept the fact that their pets are going to cost them money, extra money. Yeah. So I like that part about it, obviously. But also, uh, they're very f- straightforward when, when you start asking them, it's like, well, what kind of pet it is? What, what size is it? And, you know, they kind of straightforward. This particular guest sent us pictures, actually. Yeah, and actually, like, then the breed name, we Googled it. We Googled <laughs> it, right, <laughs> yeah, right. So and kind of it is, yeah. And they explained, you know, this is a work, I mean, not a work dog. It's, a, it's a, actually a pet, but he goes to work with me because I work on a construction side, something like that. You know, it's like, that's fine. I don't worry about it. Yeah, and and a good thing, we'll, we'll just, just to jump in a little bit. So when you do a C... This is when allowing the pet is a good thing because especially during the seasonal rentals, people stay longer than one week. Right. So, and that's a lot of people have pets. They cannot leave them or it's leaving them somewhere. It's more expensive. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you, you're looking at two, three months, usually people who staying with the pet. Right. And they usually an, want, you know, a whole house because yeah. obviously they understand it's less that's a chance nice to bother chunk anybody. Of money. Usually, right. so you don't want to miss on that. But let's go with those advices. What we figured so, out. Yeah, yeah. So actually, and Daniil is completely right here. What actually is the case is that in terms of making money, since we're on the money topic, the the least of money is going to be made with long term rentals. Then the most amount of money that you're going to make with your rentals are short term rentals, which is anything from one day to a month or so. Yeah. But the seasonal, which is what we're doing, which is anywhere between 30 and 365 days, that's your seasonal rental. Well, I kind of have it a little bit more detailed, like 30 days to 60 or to 90, kind of. That's how I work it. And then sometimes people extend. But in order to make up that difference between the price of a short-term rental and the seasonal rental, you can just allow pets. And you make up the difference. And that means less stress. Less having to organize cleaners to come in there yeah. every two or three days. Less issues with people partying that only come in for the party weekends. Because the seasonal mostly, they, you know, They kind of the live there more or less, so they yeah. kind of rearrange their furniture sometimes. They kind of is move it, into the it's fridge, It's not your you know? St. Patrick's Day weekend, but it's like right. hell breaks loose. <laughs> right, and you don't have to worry as much about it. So this is kind of how you can make up for it but there's a there's a couple of rules that you need to follow to in order to save yourself a lot of hassle later on yeah one of which is if you have properties with carpets you're not going to have those carpets very long no <laughs> so please count in that you will need to replace those carpets or at the very least very frequently have them professionally cleaned or clean them yourself if you have the equipment for it yep that's that's a big thing and that this is what anybody will tell you with long term rentals too Carpets is kind of like avoid carpets at all costs. And it's not just animals. I mean, a lot of times families are, we have a four bedroom house. So we have a lot of uh, families coming in. And little right. kids, they can be, they're, <laughs> they can sometimes be as they're distractive. Sometimes they're worse than animals. Yes, <laughs> yeah, they can absolutely. be as distractive. Exactly. I mean, as, as far as, yeah, yeah okay. <laughs> as far as uh, causing damages and, and causing dirt, I think the two are kind of on the yes. same level. So the carpets I mean, are definitely, you want to put it in the in account for yeah long just term. account on replacing carpets and even if you put like cheap rental grade carpets you know it's still gonna run you a couple hundred dollars maybe or so which sometimes is better to replace the carpets than clean them because the cost will after two or three times cleaning you might as well just replace it and then in that case just go ahead and put something else in there laminate or something else that's sort of cheap but still easier to clean and by the way i am very proud of myself i painted my first 
laminate floor the other day and it, it looks good. amazing it looks it good looks very good it does it so does. if you want to you know freshen up your laminate floors i can give you tips on that but other tips obviously is you you need to calculate that money for replacing the carpets or cleaning into the price and there is no such way of how to charge pet rental on Airbnb website for yeah. sure. You can if you're a long-term tenant and I've paid this before, like a pet rent basically. But what we've just doing, we just jack up our cleaning prices yeah. on, on every rental, which kind of like, it's not very nice for the people that don't bring pets, but sometimes the people that don't bring pets are, you know, just as bad as the other ones. But <laughs> we kind of distribute the, the, the prices, not yeah. just on the cleaning, but also on the management and the organization, because obviously once you have a bigger cleaning job, you also need to close your house down for a couple of days to have Ab- to allow absolutely. time to do that. And, and where you get all this information, how we did it, we just did the, pretty much your basic research. We went on Google, find the cleaning in the, in the area, in the county or the city or the village, whatever you had. Mm-hmm. Uh, just call one of your local and try to get like a corporate, not like mom and pop. Because mom and pop, you know, they, they, they play with their own prices. But the corporate, who who did we call mm. one of those famous uh, something? Mm. Kelly's Cleaning? Maids. Or? Something with Maids. It's the name of the company eludes me right now. But it's yeah. Mary Maids. I believe oh, Mary, it's Mary Maids. Mary Maids, like yeah. That. But they, they're national wide. So we actually called in a few areas like Macon, Georgia, Conyers, Georgia, you know, Bibb County, Chatham County, pretty much, and got about, and the prices vary, obviously depends on the area, and mm-hmm. it gives you an idea, um, because- uh, Always of, get the estimate, yeah. Yeah, the estimate was, I think, on one of the houses in Atlanta, which we're discussing right now, was somewhere around $800. Yeah, but here's that's the, a lot, That's actually. a lot, yeah, but here's the thing, it's a lot if you're staying for a week, but if people are coming for three months, they bring their, their own pet, and I used to have a dog back in the day, and even to go for a week somewhere and give the dog to the doggy hotel, mm-hmm. that pretty much will cost you right. for a week that amount. Right. So people will pay that price. Yeah, yeah. I've paid $50 a night for my cat, I remember. Yeah, Long and it's a, a, and depends, again, if the pet didn't do a lot of damage, you can do it yourself and save yourself that money. Mm-hmm. But if the damage is done, there, there's professional people. And again, you can estimate as well. I think the ladies told me it takes them up to 48 hours. So you got to close the house. They're like 72, but 48 hours minimum to mm-hmm. clean from the pets because they got to pull the cushions. They got to do all the... Uh, couches, under the beds, because everything needs to be moved, mm-hmm. especially if you have a allergic person coming in. Mm-hmm. So, but that's what, what we did, the research. This is how we come up with a price and put it up for the every property or whatever properties we're using. If people ask, it's like, oh, why so expensive? Well, here's the estimate. I actually right. have the estimate that I didn't come up with it. Right. And, uh, and you can distribute that amount on the days of rent as well. I mean, you can... Mm-hmm. At least you can try that. If somebody stays for 30 days and it costs 800 extra dollars to clean it or $800 to clean, you know, divide that by your 30 days and add it on. You're not going to be as competitive maybe as the other people in your county or in that area. But you but will not scare people that, you know, that right. the $800 bill is like, oh. Right, and people will not even, they might not search on the on the other guys. You know, they might search specifically for people that allow pets at yeah. places, so... That's kind of so, like the new thing that we did. We actually are allowing tentatively, first one now, allowing some people with pets. Now, of course, you, you need to kind of keep a lid on it, too. You know, so you allow pets doesn't mean you can bring like your six dogs and your two cats and your three parrots. And yeah, it's just which, <laughs> you know, obviously, once you open that little do- door, you know, you're kind of letting in opening the floodgates there sometimes. So you got to be careful. We, we do have cameras outside, so we do monitor at least what's going on outside. These are safety cameras. These are not necessarily yeah. cameras to spy on our guests, yeah. but it also helps us a little bit to eliminate uh-huh. any kind of issues, whereas where they think they can maybe get away with something, you know, they, they might shy away when they know that there's mm-hmm. cameras there. So. Yeah, and it's obviously safety. We always we tell people it's safety, but it also helps us to see when people checking in and checking out. Right. Because, you know, sometimes, I'm, I mean, we have properties away. We're staying in Savannah. 
I need to know when people, I mean, <laughs> I, I cannot control when people check out or check in. So I look at the camera, I see the car, I make the phone call. Right, right. And get my cleaners organized. I cannot have my cleaners sitting half a day waiting because the guests didn't check out. Right, right. And that's happened many times. Many times, <laughs> People yeah. forgetting their checkout time and we've got people sitting waiting. So yeah. anyway, so that was, actually, that brings us to the bottom of the hour. We're on for Real Estate Real Talk here, we're talking today about allowing pets and your seasonal rentals or rentals in general. We can talk a little bit more about that if we have something else, but uh, we're at the bottom of the hour, so we'll play a couple announcements now and some music, and we will be right back after this. So please stay on. Don't go anywhere. You're listening to Real Estate Real Talk with Julia M. Spencer and Daniil Ivanov. We'll be right back. Remote Area Medical will hold a free two-day dental-only clinic on August 27th to 28th at the Garden City Recreation Center located at 160 Priscilla D. Thomas Way, Garden City, for two days only. All services are free and no ID is required. Free dental services will be provided on a first-come, first-served basis. The patient parking lot will open no later than 11.59 p.m., midnight on Friday night, August 26th, and will remain open for the duration of the clinic. Once in the parking lot, additional information regarding clinic operating processes and next steps will be provided. Clinic doors open at 6 a.m. More information can be found at www.ramusa.org or call 865-579-1530. The first Friday for Folk Music in-person concert on Friday, September 2nd, 2022, will be at the First Presbyterian Church, Stewart Hall, 520 Washington Avenue in Savannah. It will feature two sets at 7.30 and 9.30 p.m. with Deirdre McCalla. Deirdre McCalla is a singer, songwriter, guitarist whose irresistible blend of folk, country, rock, and pop seizes the listener by the heart and won't let go more information can be found at www.savannafolk.org what does it mean when we say that wruu is a community radio station it doesn't just mean that we invite the community to create programming and it doesn't just mean that we are a voice for the community it also means that we are counting on the community to keep us going and you are the community Almost all of our modest budget comes from small annual or monthly donations from listeners like you. You get to enjoy our community-focused programming because many others have stepped forward to do their part. Now do your part by joining our community of listener donors. Go to wruu.org right now and make a one-time or monthly donation. And thank you for supporting Savannah's community radio station, 107.5 FM. Anyways, thank you for tuning into Real Estate Real Talk with Julia M. Spencer and Daniil Ivanov. We're talking today about allowing pets in your rentals and our experiences with those kinds of things. I can tell you all kinds of horror stories from back in the day. I'd rather not even relive those moments. And I'm talking specifically about people actually locking in their pets in their homes and leaving for days at a time. And then you can just imagine the outcome of that and having carpets in the houses most of the time at that time. So there's a lot of little things that you can do to help yourself out in the future and kind of screen your tenants a little bit, you know, kind of encourage them to share information about their pet to make sure that, you know, they are actually bringing just that one pet or two pets or whatever you allow and not a whole zoo. And, uh, you know, keep yourself protected on the financial side by collecting some pet rent or pet uh -huh. fees that can po possibly offset any kind of damages or cleaning that you have to do. We have one more topic I think I wanted to talk about today. I actually just came from, from Forsyth Park over at Ascension Bean where I spoke to a student or a, uh, aspiring investor. And if he's listening, shout out. And we were we had one question that actually stood out to me in, in that chat that I wanted to bring to all of you guys here because I think it's kind of important. It's one of the, it's like a subjective kind of opinion that you can't really read that in the textbook unless you're actually talking to somebody that's done, done it and been there, been there and done that basically. 
Uh, so we were talking about tax sale foreclosures and some of the things that a tax sale foreclosure, a new tax sale foreclosure, should watch out for when they purchase properties at the auctions. And a lot of people ask the same question. This is not like a question that is very unique or anything. This is a very common question that I'm being asked. Uh, do you have to worry about the mortgage? What happened to the other liens on the property that the property may have a loan on it? Am I responsible to pay that? Am I responsible to pay the lawn guy that wasn't paid that has a lien on the property? What am I responsible for as an investor? What do I need to watch out for? We talked about all the things that need to be watched out for, which are pretty common things. You know, you in some cases you are going to be asked to pay the mortgage even though you're not responsible for it. But in order to clean the title, you may have to. That's a... Uh, um, p- that's something that people a lot of times in this profession don't really realize because you think, oh, you know, a tax lien is senior to a mortgage lien, so uh, automatically everything that's junior is erased. But it's not always the case, especially not if the mortgage is backed by a federal agency. And so they have what is called a conservatorship, which means they can conserve their loan against that property and still make their claim uh, be heard in a court of law and might even still win. So you got to be careful about that. As well as on title issues, you may have title issues, which means that when you buy a property at a tax sale, you're not getting a good title. You're getting a flawed title that's defined as flawed in our laws. And that just basically means that you're not going to be able to get title insurance. And what that means in return is you can't get a loan on it. So uh, in order to clean that title up, you got to spend more money and uh, do quiet title action. Or you got to talk to the previous owner and have them sign a quick claim deed. Or else you just have to wait a, a long time in order for it to be uh, a good title by prescription. So if you use a property for a long amount of time and you have your feet on there and visit it every once in a while and pay the taxes on it and, and actively occupy it, such as cut the grass, which is something that we need to talk about, then you can make a claim against it, which is one of those special laws that we have in the Georgia statutes right here. But the one question that was not asked, and I always tell people this, is like sometimes you just don't know what you don't know, which is a really dangerous place to be, especially when you start dealing with money and investing in real estate, is that you will be getting very, very cozy, not only with code compliance, but also with the district attorney's office. (laughs) (laughs) We we got him on the speed dial. (laughs) He's laughing. I had... um, and and maybe they're listening again this week. I don't know. I know they were listening last week, probably. Shout out. <laughs> Shout out to all the district attorney's office where I own property. And tax commissioners. <laughs> and tax commissioners, yes. And and this is not something I really wanted to get into because I'm, not, you know, I don't want to be a Karen. I was telling you this the other day. I was like, I don't want to be a Karen because I hate nitpicking and laws and and going through all the details of everything you know i kind of just like to get stuff done and and move on with my life and do other things but you get Mm. dragged into these things sometimes where you just kind of sometimes it's not the case yeah you don't have another choice you don't have a choice yeah what happened this last week is uh, and we were reporting on this last week we have a property right now in in macon bibb county that uh, we got written up for for code compliance issues. We did take the necessary steps to clear the lot, to board up the house. But, you know, in unfortunately, the code compliance guys uh, threw the book at us a second time and basically said it wasn't boarded up the right way. And there was gaps that they were showing in the windows and it was just not done neatly and properly. And we should have went and cut the actual wood to the size of the windows and fit it in there perfectly. And what what, what materials to use. And what materials to use and what screws to use. I mean, there is is a book, apparently, an international code compliance standard that has been adopted but by that particular county in order of how to board up a house correctly. And where it's originated, we don't know because it's in English, but it's international. Right, it's international. <laughs> and know. and the thing is, if you've never dealt with such minute detail of trying to follow a law, then you don't know anything about it. And I certainly didn't know anything about any kind of code compliance standards up until last week. And I was basically told you need to follow these standards. And I'm like, okay, well, I can't find them. I don't know what they yeah, are. Yeah, he was like, Google it. So we're going, <laughs> yeah, we're going back and forth between the inspectors and the district attorney's office and me on how to freaking properly 
board up these windows, which I've never had to deal with. This is a brand new thing for me. So, and of course, then of course our contractors. So we got the district attorneys, the inspectors, myself, and the contractors. Too and many you cookies and me, in the jar. So there's many mistakes. A, there's yeah. a lot of hands in this in this cookie jar, and a lot of soup, a lot of people in the kitchen, which is a really a bad thing because a lot of stuff. Can be lost in translation. Yeah, communication is really key in this, and and we've obviously lost the track here somewhere. But I mean, I I do have to give a shout out to to Macon Bibb County for working with us, working with us, and being understanding. You know, especially the district attorney's office. I'm happy with that, with the fact that I actually finally got through to somebody because that was the initial problem that we had that we've been calling and nobody called us back. So we finally, you know, maybe are going to be on the same page here in a week. But that is one of the key underlying issues that you need to deal with that you may not know about when you're purchasing tax or foreclosures anywhere in the, w- in the country. It doesn't even matter whether it's Chatham County or Georgia or any other state. Is The code compliance people are watching these tax sales too. They know when the ownership of a property that's a blighted property or that's in in bad shape and they know when these properties are switching hands and they know the addresses and the phone numbers and they will send code compliance officers probably specifically to those particular purchased properties because now they have a new owner to go after to fix these problems. And these counties and these officials are very much interested in cleaning up their neighborhoods. I mean, this is something that raises everybody's property values if it's done correctly. It is also alleviates, you know, maybe issues of crime, you know, if a property is well kept and well maintained, there's less chance of people kind of squatting in, in vacant buildings and causing, you know, problems in the neighborhood. Mm-hmm. And the neighbors, of course, will complain and then cops will be called and all that. You know, I mean, there's a, there's a lot of interest by government officials to clean up neighborhoods, yeah, basically. Absolutely. Saving money for the city that somebody else is going to pay for cleaning it, not them coming out right, and doing right. it. So. And, that's, and that's another thing. So when properties are not being maintained and there is no owner to go after, a lot of times counties, depending on their budget, code compliance place offices mm-hmm. will send their own people. Yeah, or they need to get the contractors, and the contractors not playing around. As soon as they found out it's a county, they're like, "Ha, huh, sweet, <laughs> let's right. get some money." Right, and they're going to charge you for the Arm most the expensive yeah. Yeah. materials and the most expensive cru- screws. And you know, I've had it happen where I purchased the property for two thousand dollars, but then the, just the boarding up job was ten thousand because yeah, they used like expensive the plastic, gla- <laughs> plastic like plexiglass and. And basically made made the thing yeah, you like know it looked like an ice bomb ho- proof. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's like ice hockey arena, like with those shields yeah. around. <laughs> so the biggest problem that you're dealing with is not really dealing with the mortgage because that actually doesn't happen very often. It doesn't happen with any kind of environmental issues. You know, you're not rarely ever are you gonna run into buying a property that has an like environmental leak of some sort or some sort of underground gas tank that has exploded on it or anything like that. I mean, those things just don't happen. And also very rarely are the people going after you to claim their property back because if it's gotten to this point already, there is already likely not a whole lot of interest. And if they are serious about getting their property back, they'll pay you back within your redemption period, the time that they have to get it back. But what you're dealing with is basically cleaning up that property and not just cleaning it up, but also negotiating with the government officials, county or city or whoever, to have the prices or the money reduced that you, that is already on the property for previous property maintenance. Yeah, which we actually ran into with the, uh, we, we're fighting, well, we're not fighting, we, we're dealing with it right now. It's the uh, the waste management. Right on the property because even though the property wasn't livable we and proved it that it's not livable yeah there's no trash containers haven't yeah. been there in years yeah. and the previous owner was actually the county yeah and so. they still they're like oh we cannot like erase well what they said they cannot take the money off for the previous right months which is I don't know. We still we still working on it, but th- this is this is the problems right. will <laughs> you will deal with. Yeah, you will get you get bills you don't even know that you have coming your way. So always have a cushion planned in when you buy oh, yeah. these properties, and or have some some way you can figure out how to deal with it. I remember buying this property in in Macon Bibb County actually, and this is years ago. There's a video on this actually. Is the one by see. Mercer? Yes, yes, it's near New Mercer University. 
And as soon as I got it, I mean, literally within a day, the county was swamp, like, swamp. you <laughs> need to tear this building down. It's there's somebody's going to walk by it and a rock's going to fall or bricks going to fall. So they were the just top. waiting on something. They were you waiting. <laughs> they were waiting. They were waiting. And unfortunately, you know, I lost that property because yeah. I couldn't afford to do anything to it at that time. It was already boarded up. It was in bad shape. But it was this huge brick building. It was beautiful. It, it was, was beautiful. right by Mercer, too, and right still, ac- across the bridge from right. Mercer, yeah. And it's still sitting there exactly as when I purchased it. There because there's... nobody wants to tear it down. <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah, nobody tore it down. And, you know, they're just waiting as it changes hands during the tax sales. And that's another uh, red flag. I was also telling this gentleman that I had a meeting with earlier is when you see a property switching hands in tax sales over and over and over again in the property records, there, you know, there's, there's something, something going, going on, on yeah. and you want to probably stay away from that one, you know, unless you really know what's going on. If you don't know, stay away from it. You know, Absolutely. there's, there's lower hanging fruit. Which we fruit. do have a radio show on that one, too, about, like, some, it can be not just, there is there is a lot of, you, you pinpointed a lot of things, like, and examples where, you remember, there was some kind of factory was backed up to the property, you're not allowed to build on it. Or right. There is, like, little so many glitches I easements mean. and sizes of lots sometimes lots are being sold there five foot uh, wide and 200 feet long and it's like yeah it's a pretty big lot it's like half an acre but you can't do anything with it yeah like I we mean, did with the fusky island right. we can get there right the fusky island i bought a property in the fusky island the only way to get there is by boat yeah and it's like seven <laughs> bucks <laughs> it was a bicycle yeah it was seventy dollars yeah. to bring a bicycle on the on the ferry. Well, the the property in Milton too. I think it's a beautiful property, but it took us forever to find it. Yeah, we couldn't <laughs> find it. Okay, well, we can talk about that. That's going to be our last segment. Actually, we only have like ten minutes left. But yeah. let's just talk about that briefly because our adventures are many. We actually should have. We should probably go back there and make a video and post that on yeah, the YouTube Yeah, we should do it. Like maybe a little bit better weather. I don't know if it's going to rain, but right. good idea, good idea. Right, right. So another property I bought at a tax sale in June of this year, actually. Mm-hmm. So it's still in the redemption period. I'm like, let's just drive by there and see because on the map, on the GIS map, it looks like there's a building on it. But on the property card, there's no building. So I'm like, hmm. So I look at the map. It looks like half the building. Again, one of those half buildings where the property line goes straight through the building. And believe it or not, people, this is not as uncommon as you think. That's actually one of the more common things is to find a a GIS map where one building is on two lots, adjacent lots, and they belong to two different people, which I have no idea how that you know, how comes that happened about. And, yeah, and how you handle it. How do you handle it? That's that's a whole other story. I mean, but we, I, we thought of the ideas, what, what, what right. we will do. So whoever is listening, if you had that experience, Please, we want to hear it, yeah. how, how you handle that right, situation. Right. Yeah, and there's a number of ways to handle it, and I go through that in my YouTube video. There's a lot of shows on this. But in this particular case, we actually, not only was it, there was a trailer on it. It's yeah. a single wide trailer, and it's on two lots. One of those lots is mine, according to the last tax on June, mm-hmm. which is hasn't redeemed yet, which probably won't redeem. Yeah. And the problem wasn't even that, though. The problem was, how do you get to it? Yeah, because the address was Milton Avenue. Right, and there's no number. There's no number. And to get to there, you actually, we had to go through a different street because there was no road. We had to to keep driving around on the next street over. There was no outlet. Come back. Go the second next street over. No outlet. Come back. No (laughs) outlet. Come back. Then it's like, oh, there's a creek here. Let's go around the other side. And that's when we finally were able to find that there was like a, an overgrown dirt road next to a ditch. That's how you could get to it. And, so and I'm thinking time to invest in the drones. <laughs> Try to fly the drones. How <laughs> right. to get there? <laughs> right. What do you do with a property like that? I don't know yet. I have some ideas. And I have shared very, those ideas. Yeah, and it's very overgrown too. So right. I don't even know how to get the equipment up there to clear it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, and uh, that's going to be my next one, you know. So if you can code compliance people in Chatham County are listening, of course, yeah. I'm sure you are. And you're always on my back, so I'm sure you're making the note, ooh, she's bought another one. Let's go after her for this one, too. So, <laughs> so you better explain to us how we can clear it because it can get you. <laughs> yeah, explain to me how to get there, and I'll clear it. So. 
<laughs> Anyways, funny but story. But the trailer, yeah, the trailer was very funny because the front of the trailer looks like somebody possibly even lives in there. Yes. Until you look at the side. <laughs> yeah, the side does not look like that. So, and yeah. of course, if you buy properties with old trailers on it, that's that's more hassle than it's worth. I didn't know there was a trailer on it because the property card didn't say trailer, and I, of course, I didn't drive by it, and so. But there's there's ways but, to handle but, but it's very like nice too. what I say about money. this property. Yeah, so people get scared. She was like, "Oh, this trailer, it's overgrown." But the area when we drove around, when we were bouncing from one right. street to another, we obviously keep an eye on the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. uh, it's uh, some good looking houses. Yeah, up that's there. a good neighborhood. Somebody yeah. must have had that trailer before they built up around it. So, so the actual lot itself is a, is a good lot. So it has a potential. Right. If you put something, if you build on it, uh, the property value definitely going to be yep. very nice because it's it's not very, it's what, about 10 minutes away from SCAD, I would say? Yeah, it's not far at all, no. yeah. Not even 10, maybe 5 to yep. drive. And it was a bargain, you know? Yeah. I think it was under 1000 bucks even. So. Yeah, because we went, that was again, we have a radio show, we went go on the on the auction for the second day. This mm -hmm. is when you can get very cheap. The, <laughs> the bargains of the bargains, basically. Yeah. <laughs> so, Anyways, uh, that brings us to the top of the hour already. You were listening to Real Estate Real Talk with Julia M. Spencer and Daniil Ivanov. If you want to listen to past shows, they are on my YouTube channel, just my name, Julia M. Spencer. You can also listen to them on the WRUU.org website under archives. Just go to Wednesday, scroll down to 12 o'clock, 12.06 specifically. There's some old shows there, not all of them, but there's some. And you can always contact me and send me questions, realestate at juliamspencer.com. Or you can uh, just leave me comments on my YouTube videos. I'll see those too. Find us on social media. We're always there. Yep. Yeah. We're going to go to Clary's. Clary, is it Clary? Clary, Clary's Cafe or That's something? That's where we're going to be. You we're said some be. movie was shot in there. Or I, th I think so. But let me research that some more. I thought it was, but let me check and see. And we'll sure. let you know how was lunch actually next week. We're still here. Yay. Yep, we're going to be here a couple more weeks before we head out again. Stay tuned to our shows. I know for sure that two weeks in September we will not be here. So there's going to be recorded shows because nobody's going to be sitting in for me. So you'll hear this show again and the one from previous week probably. Yeah. So we're going to post those. So Okay, well, have a great Wednesday, everybody. I'm going to play some more music for my out -long and Stay real state, Savannah. Right. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. -bye. Bye. For your free guide to real estate investing, visit juliamspencer.com.